Good afternoon. Or should I say good evening? Good evening. Evening. Hi, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Very well, thank you. Very well. And from a cold, wet uh, London. Uh, I, summer has sort of arrived and, and has gone away again. Uh-oh. So quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's very annoying. And bearing in mind, we have to sit and socialize outside. <laughs> and uh, it's actually, we're dressing up and going out into the Antarctic uh, to go and have a drink with our neighbors. This is, this is British summer. We will wear shorts no matter what the yeah, weather. Yeah, uh, that's true. No matter what, right? No matter what. Do you feel, did you, did you mention that it's starting to kind of, people are starting to gather a little bit more there? Well, it's opening up here. I mean, Brian and I have spent the last year working at home. And so because the vaccination program has been so huge and so successful in the UK, uh, it's opening up. Offices are opening up. Um, and I think till, is it the 21st? That's when it's really opening up. Restaurants are opening up. And, and I think the stats are showing that we're all um, in quite good shape for opening up. I think there was one COVID death yesterday. So um, it almost feels like there's almost the start of it becoming normal-ish. Emerging from our little bunkers. Yeah, that's excellent. Just in time for um, warm weather, kind of. Yes. <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> Who cares, quite frankly? Um, just to know, be just outside with people, right? Anywhere. Yes. People yeah. and do stuff right. and, you know, yeah. Get, get, on, get on the tube and sort of <laughs> get it. Get, get, can't wait to have my face in somebody's armpit again. I'm so nostalgic. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, we're really excited to hear what you've been up to, because I know this last year you've both been very busy. Yeah. Um, so I want to welcome everybody to um, our Think Northwest event. We are here today with Brian Miller and Tori Chilcott, and they are going to talk about their baby, um, their figurative uh, baby that they have born and raised this last year, Fubi. I'm so excited to hear about kind of how that got started, what you're doing with it, how it can help marketers. Um, let's start with just some introductions. Tell us a little bit about yourselves. Okay, uh, my name is Tori um, and uh, I've been working with Brian for about four years now. Um, we came together when we started to think about uh, understanding more about audiences on the internet. Um, but my background previously to that was television. I spent 20 years in television and working as a format writer, producer, but specializing in big entertainment shows and factual entertainment shows. I then had a business that I started in 2007, which was creating original content for brands. And then essentially we built a distribution platform. And it was during the process of working in that business that I started to think, actually, there are better ways in which we can engage people on the internet. And through uh, introductions, I was introduced to Brian Miller here. Um, and Brian. Hi. So, yeah, so I, I started my career in advertising. I worked at places like Saatchi's and Ogilvy um, um, in, in um, sort of UK, France and, and the US. And... Uh, then got more and more interested in uh, new product development and ended up um, working uh, as a partner in an innovation um, company. We worked um, with Nike and uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield. So I was across in Portland quite a lot and I'm very nostalgic uh, for its, uh, its delightful weirdness and also its rain, uh, which made me feel at home. And um, yeah, so one day um, this uh, uh, person called Tori walked in through the doors of our company and uh, we started to talk about how we would think about audiences in a different way, think about them like entertainers and that's what we're here to talk to you about today. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're gonna, uh, how to think like an entertainer. Um, just so you, uh, which I think probably is important. I worked and had uh, the pleasure of working on shows like Pop Idol in the UK, um, and I worked on the first series of American Idol in the uh, US, which uh, nearly killed all of us, um, but was brilliant fun. And I've had the pleasure of working on shows like So You Think You Can Dance, and particularly in the US, and then was 
uh, the format writer for Simon Cowell for a short while, um, as he insisted on selling programme ideas on the back of a packet of cigarettes, because he's a hardcore smoker, without actually giving it much consideration as to what the show was. So there was a team of us who had to go around and sort of slowly unpick those ideas and unsell them, which uh, is quite a challenge, to be honest. Um, so how to think like an entertainer? That's far away. Cool. So, you know, I was out of advertising for a long time. I came back to it um, after, you know, sort of a decade and a bit of, of new product development. I thought surely the world has, has changed. And I was surprised that it hadn't and that advertising was still really using a lot of the same models that have been very successful for, um, you know, print, outdoor and, and TV. Um, but in the meantime, uh, you know, and, and this is not a advertising has a problem um, ha -ha, uh, presentation, um, but let's let's just put it out there. So, uh, you know, there is a, a, you know, half a trillion dollars or more spent on advertising. 4% um, of it is remembered positively, 7% is remembered neg negatively, but most of it just beeps off as um, kind of space junk into the, the void and is never actually noticed at all. Um, but we all know that there are brands in this, this new world who are, are killing it online. And there's a brand that we've worked very closely with from the beginning, which has become incredibly successful in the UK. And one of the, the things that's really delightful is how many clients we visit, which have lots of Rude Health packs of cereal. There, there are uh, cereal and um, they also do almond milk and all those kind of things. Um, brands, but um, they have them up in their offices as kind of like, why can't we be like this? Um, and we've worked with Rude Health since there were two guys around a, a, a kitchen or a, a married couple around a kitchen table, um, sort of mixing mixing the stuff by hand. And the thing is, they have built a, um, a, a brand which PepsiCo has taken a 10% stake in now. Um, and they have never really thought of themselves as a brand. They have always thought of themselves as, as entertainers, as, as show people. And um, they, 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 they've, advertising budget has been zero, um, but their social media following is, is huge. Their, their presence as a kind of super brand in the UK is, is huge. And they do this um, really by acting <laughs> much more like a, um, a, a celebrity does online. Um, they, they don't really go in for a single tone of voice. Um, they, they do naked bike rides. They, um, they, they do recipes. They have big rants um, about uh, big food and stuff like that. So they have a lot of different kind of personalities. And we were looking at a lot of these kind of brands online who were really seemed like they were breaking a lot of rules of advertising, but were behaving a lot more like, like celebrities, like entertainers do online. And if you look at Kellogg's versus Rude Health, um, Kellogg's, you know, is, is a very sort of, you know, a big by the book marketer. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it validates creative executions. And, you know, as, as advertisers, we all know and love this, right? Um, you know, it's uh, going to, um, you know, get all your, your storyboards, all your stuff and put it in a focus group and have people rub all the interesting edges of it. There's a friend of ours who is, um, a market researcher and she went into market research because her dad, her, both of her, her uncles are big London creative directors and like going into market research was the most annoying thing she could possibly do to them. Um, so, uh, but there's also, re you know, repetition, you know, the, the sort of classic advertising thing is just bang away at a single, a, a single point until, you know, it's, you remember the economist is, is for clever people. Um, consistency, again, you know, read The Economist, one tone of voice, smarty pants for The Economist, um, one call to action, go and buy a copy. And, you know, but people like Kellogg's, they, they you know, they, they really just moved the advertising thinking that works, you know, in, in, in the interruptive model into the content model and, it, and it, it sort of starts to fall apart. Root Health and brands who think like entertainers um, think in a very, really different way. Um, so they start with their audience like an entertainer does. They, they, they validate their audience's preferences. What, what are these people into? Where do they go? What makes them laugh? Um, what makes them cry? Let's do stuff like that. They go for surprise rather than consistency. What they're doing is actually, what can I do? Think about Red Bull, right? You know, Red Bull is just constantly, 
whacking you with all sorts of kind of crazy stuff. Um, you know, there's not a lot of rhyme and reason behind it. It's just, but, but it's always bringing news to, to things. Um, and it's about sort of, we talk about sort of moving from consistency and repetition to coherence. You know, consistent, uh, consistency worked when you had three campaigns a year, right? And you were just focused on, you know, here's your new car model launch and then there's the next new model, car model launch and the next one. When you're always on or when even worse, you're following somebody around because, um, you know, they've got a certain number of cookies and they're seeing that ad five times a day. It gets really re repetitious really fast. So how do you start to, to do stuff that's different? Light and shade. So you think about storytelling. There's, there's been, you know, everybody's a brand storyteller now. But the thing is, storytelling needs light and shade, right? It needs different changes of pace. Um, even Fast and Furious movies have to have quiet moments, otherwise they would just be noise. Um, and so storytelling is really incompatible with a lot of the sort of advertising ideas um, of, of consistency and repetition and, and tone of voice. And then ultimately about mobilizing fandom. So this is about more than just um, saying, please buy our cereal. This is about kind of join a movement, join a movement that really hates Kellogg's. Um, join a movement that wants to go out and do new, new, uh, new unis unicycling or bog snorkeling, which is something you just have to Google. It's, 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 even the British kind of go, that is quite eccentric. Um, but ultimately, what these guys do, they're not thinking like advertisers. They are winning because they are thinking like entertainers. So where uh, I suppose uh, Barn and I start is where, you know, ads are here and gone and but tv formats when you get a tv format right it can run and run and it can make everyone involved a stack of millions of pounds and or dollars and it can, can create generations of, of fans so when we started working together we started thinking okay these are brands that are thinking like entertainers so what actually do entertainers do how do uh people like me in my previous life um, really approach uh, an entertainment format. So when the first thing an entertainment format would do would be who's the audience? What ages are they? Where do they live? Where in terms of uh, what are their trends? What are their cultural nuances? How do they really engage with the subject area that you're thinking about going into? Then you'll start to think, okay, also, where's this gonna be? What time is it gonna be at? What's the talent that we're going to be um, associated with? And then you start to think about what the idea is. Um, it may be that there's a whole um, area which are called precincts that you start to explore. So for instance, with Idol, we wanted to do um, a talent show, I, you know, uh, finding talent. And then once you started to explore finding talent, then there are all the layers in which the talent competition and judging goes, then you start to think about, okay, something like the masked singer. The masked singer is a, uh, is a, um, a guessing game and a singing competition. So you start to think about how do those ideas come together? Then what's the jeopardy? What's gonna be the bits that we all lean forward or we all gasp at, or we all think, okay, right, why would I really care? When do we start crying? In Idol, in the early days, early days of American Idol, it used to be a lot funnier than it is now. It's become much more serious, much more earnest. And as soon as you hear that music go, we all know as the audience, we've, it's time to cry and it's time to be moved and it's time to be sad. But then how do you bring the jeopardy so that you want to come back and see it again? And then what happens once you've created a format that maybe runs a series, you want to think about how does it come back year on year on year and still bringing audiences. So Brian and I started to think about, okay, these are the rules of entertainment. These are the rules of format making. These are the ways in which you can bring longevity into an audience's engagement. So then how do we start to really apply this? Um, Next slide. So what do we do? We started to think about actually the most important channel that uh, has ever happened in any of our lives is the internet. So we, we started to think, okay, how do you know what audiences love? What kind of content that people really, really engage with? 
and, and, and what entertains people? So we asked that simple question, what do audiences love? And when Brian and I started working together, we kind of did it because we went around the whole research community in Europe and said, could you tell us what makes people laugh? Could you tell, tell us what, what, you know, what people find thrilling or what's cute? And people sort of went, well, that's such a stupidly obvious question. And the answer is, well, they couldn't tell us. So we decided to go off and find out ourselves. And there was no brand filter on this. It was not a commission other than the fact that we came together and went, actually, this is a really important question. And until we know the answer, how do we know how to engage people and entertain them online? So we started to ask. And what we found that there are four types of engaging content. They fall into the four pillars in which people really, really lean in and really engage. And they are funny, useful, beautiful and inspiring. And when you look at each and every one of these uh, pillars, you realize that uh, once you see it, you don't ever unsee it. Uh, we nicknamed it Fubi, and it's been Fubi ever since, isn't it? And I'm afraid it will kind of get in your head. Uh, but Fubi it was, and what came back to us when we, we asked uh, initially 5,000 people, what do you love? How do you love it? When, when do you love it? And that was that started to be the pillars of uh, our Phoebe research. Phoebe, however, comes in lots of different ways. And so from the research that we had been doing, we realized that funny, useful, beautiful, inspiring uh, were big subject areas. So we went back out into the res uh, into more research and asked 2000 people how these genres and we can run through exactly how we got all this information with you guys in a minute but um we started to go look at here are the genres so funny we realized that there's satire dark self-deprecating parody toilet surreal slapstick deadpan we had such fun putting these uh little um, symbols together and we hope you find them as funny as we did <laughs> Um, it's, all, it's also fantastic talking to mathematicians about things like slapstick vectors. Yes, um, but you can start to see where we were going with this. We were starting to really, really map and chart people's uh, content preferences and the genres in which uh, those people on the internet were really, really excited with and engaged with. So there are lots of ways to be funny, useful, beautiful and inspiring. And uh, next slide, please, driver. So when you look at someone like Victoria Beckham, I've had the pleasure of working with Victoria Beckham and David Beckham and all the winners of Idol and with uh, the Spice Girls themselves. And when you watch someone like Victoria, who pop star, member of the Spice Girls, probably wasn't the most noisy and uh, most famous of the Spice Girls, she gets together with uh, one of the most famous footballers in the world but starts to make a move into fashion. And the team knew that actually Victoria's superpower was the fact that she was multi-layered and multi-dimensional. And so they launched her fashion, Victoria Beckham's fashion line on, on, uh, on the internet alone using these four different pillars of content. And so Victoria is funny and she shows up and she is funny and she is engaging and unexpected. She is useful on uh, her social media channels. She has hooked up with other people. Her um, deal with Estee Lauder was all about being extremely useful and how to put makeup on. She's very funny with Vogue. I don't know whether any of you guys have watched the films that she's made with Vogue. They're really, really uh, quite tongue in cheek and self-deprecating. Um, she's funny. She's beautiful. A lot of her stuff is not only just her collections, but how she shows them. And she's inspiring and largely about being a working mom, about managing to create this in idyllic life and, and her family. And so she has all these multi layers about Victoria. What you'll also find if, if in doubt and uh, she's not getting into enough attention, she posts a picture of David Beckham with his top off. And without a shadow of doubt, it's folks. Who knew? Um, Tips. And so there's Victoria Beckham. The next uh, is Taco Bell. Uh, Taco Bell, I'm sure you all know, went through a st stage of being Taco Hell. 
And then Marissa Thalberg came in and started to really change the dynamic within um, Taco Bell. They were funny and they were picking arguments with people on Twitter. They were useful in they, how they redesigned their app. They came on and they hit Instagram with their art that is so pop and stylized and inspiring in the fact that they were the first fast food chain to really encourage people to get married there. It was kind of fun and cheeky, but you know, in inspiring stories, their backstories. And their Live Mass scholarship program was not about finding the most sporty or the most academic kids. It was finding out about the kids who were in their audience, who were holding down two or three jobs, who needed the opportunity. So if you get a chance to check out the Live Mass scholarship, I'm sure some of you already know it, but it, it was how did Taco Bell start on all these different touch points and have a multi-dimensional tone, style and content that was really, really appealing to their target audiences. Isn't it Taco Bell have taken over Kentucky Fried Chicken now? I think I was reading that the other day. Um, forgive me if anybody else knows better, but I that's think that's... Hmm? But anyway, yeah. yeah. Um. So this is brand thinking Formula One. Formula One, global uh, sport, has um, I think about three or 400 million uh, uh, viewers who watch any big um, Grand Prix. Over the years, it started to flatline. Over the years, the, the aging of the, the fans, and we started to look and think, okay, how did, how did motorsport in Formula One? It was, you know, here's the race, let's launch a brand new season, watch it. Here's a 30 second TV spot, here's the social media, here's the same message repeated over and over again with it's out of house or on the TV or on the radio. It's always got a male voice that was driving action clips. Repeat the message, call to action, tune in time. When are you gonna watch it? It'd been like that since I was a kid. Um, and then you start to apply entertainment thinking to Formula One and uh, F1 reached out to uh, Netflix. Now this is entertainment thinking. This is how to bring it alive, how Formula One can go from being an exciting sport into a multi-dimensional drama that involves sport, that involves a theatre of endeavour, it, it involves hot men in fast cars, it has a winner and a loser and a baddie and a goodie and who, and it's a documentary series. And now um, it's global, it's Game of Thrones of Cars, if you're going to pitch it. It's increased F1 brand awareness by new fans by 23%. It has increased the attendance of the US uh, and Mexico Grand Prix between 12 and 15%. There are new women fans, including me, to the sport. And it is absolutely gripping. Now I'm finding myself tuning into Grand Prix because having watched three series of Drive to Survive, I am now an expert. Um, but it's exciting and it's fun and uh, who will, who won't is absolutely brilliant. So yeah, so so we thought we'd uh, you know sort of sort of do a run a, a disc tape on a local uh, local hero, but uh, yeah, so so you know Nike is always held up as one of the the, the the sort of the best you know sort sort of brands out there, and you know it does have quite a sort of multi multi tone voice, but uh, you know it it is still um, I think locked into this 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 sort of world of. Um, you know, sort of, sort of repetition and just do it, and you know, a sort of, um, you know, doesn't really stretch its 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 tone very much, and it's also, you know, sort of still in in the world of kind of, you know, it's a, on the one hand you have this purpose which says everybody's a, you know, a, um, uh, everybody's an athlete, but uh, you know, it's it, it's still full of very sort of, you know, glistening hard 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 bodies in a, in a sort of Logan's Run world where nobody's over nineteen. Um, Whereas um, at the other end of the scale, there is um, an extraordinary thing, which is an app called um, Zombies Run. I don't know if any of you have, have used this. It's um, become a, a kind of running phenomenon, which um, has had now had over 4 million downloads. And these are paying downloads and you pay like 30 pounds a year. This is not, not cheap. Um, so you know, do the maths. 
so this is um, an app where you run with a story and as you run the story unfolds um, and the story is set in a, a, a sort of post-apocalyptic zombie world where there are enclaves of, of human survivors and you have to run between them with notes um, but you or with supplies or to distract zombies so that somebody can be saved but you start to also unearth secrets everybody in the base has secrets you as a character are a sort of blank slate who start to reveal you start to understand more about yourself and who you really are it's incredibly cleverly written it's uh, it's it's now up to um i think seven series plus sort of um specials and you know has its own kind of fan art and, and yes fan slash fiction um but uh um one of the one of the things about this again is it's it it, it is you know multi-toned it has you know quiet moments it has moments of high drama it has um there's a lot of comedy in it the guy who is um also telling you what to do is is kind of quite charming but also completely incompetent um which is kind of one of the the, the sort of funny things as you're, you're as you're kind of running it's written by naomi alderman who is um, a big screenwriter writes a lot of um Doc, has written Doctor Who episodes, but has also, um, since she wrote Zombies Run, also written a very successful novel. Um, you know, this is 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 kind of turning, you know, running, which you know can be boring, into something which is never repetitive and is is incredibly entertaining. So, uh, from entertainment thinking about vegetarianism being vegan or plant based. Uh, from when I was a kid in the 70s, you kind of look and it would all be about save the animals, stop eating them, give them a better lifestyle. There were a lot of out of home advertising. Imagery was always focused on something brutal or something uh, image that was about how to force us to stop eating meat for the sake of the animals. It was messages were repeated across radio and TV magazines and everything was about shock. The welfare messaging and call to action and a movement was the same from when I was a kid. Um, and it, you know, it changed your dark hashtag go vegan world as it later became. And but then the entertainers got hold of it and the game changers arrived. And this was and is and still is a fundamental hit not only as in a hit as a, a program that is watchable, but it, in its whole premise and purpose is to question your, your ability to be your very best self, to be the muscly, sexy, smart gladiator by not eating meat and focusing on plant-based food. You bring in an Oscar-winning director, you get superstar contributors, you've got Arnie and co, you discuss about every aspect of your life with superstars and superstar athletes about how they've um, adopted a plant-based diet. It's in, uh, in across the world, it's gone peer to peer, people saying, you too could be like blah if you eat a plant-based food. And the industry and the response has been phenomenal. It is the fastest and best-selling documentary on iTunes ever, and it's the most watched documentary uh, streamed on Felix, uh, Felix in Netflix uh, in its history. It is phenomenal. And you know what's, what's particularly interesting is whether the science is a little bit dubious and whether there's some of the, but nobody cares. Nobody cares no because, winning, yeah, you know, nobody cares because if you eat lots of lovely fruit and veg, you two will be absolutely gorgeous and fast and smart and capable and of doing anything. In, and relentless in bed, which is the bit that... Uh, yeah, yeah. If you haven't seen it, the sequence about uh, men having the best sex when they've had vegetables is genius. It's genius. Yeah, certainly. All those years of people telling me that carrots, I should eat carrots because it improves my eyesight. The pitch was totally wrong. <laughs> um, so, um, okay, so so to go back to this this idea then, if the first rule of showbiz is is know your audience, 
um, how do you how do you know your audience? But in a showbiz way rather than in a, an advertising way, and that's that's really what we've we've spent the last four years building, and we built it. Um, as Tori has talked about the, the model of Fubi, and uh, so we have built what we call um, the Fubalizer, which. Yeah, here we go. Okay. Um, so what you can see here now is 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 a wheel um, which um, is is very easy to read. There's four um, four big categories we talked about: funny, useful, beautiful, inspiring. And then inside that, uh, you can see the different different uh, genres. So. Um, what you what you'll see here is the stuff that's on the outside of the wheel people over index in so this is the stuff that they like um that they that the, 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 they 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 like more than average and the stuff that's on the inside is the stuff that is kind of turning them off so we started here um with uh women um in the us who are interested in motorsports and so you can see at a glance that actually you know they've got uh Quite a sort of powerful sense of humor. Um, they like outrageous stuff. They like dark stuff, surreal parody. Um, they like heartwarming stories. So again, that's one of the really cool things about um, Drive to Survive um, as as a show is these kind of kind of moments of of charm and warmth. Um, yeah, very big on cute imagery. Um, so yeah, again, uh, luckily these guys are young, and uh, you know David Ricardo is um, is wow. very cute. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, um, and also um, yeah, sort of you know spon spontaneous imagery as well. So spontaneous imagery is often the kind of stuff like you know Instagram no filter sort of stuff. Those moments of of kind of silliness and goofiness. Um, so what this does is it starts to build up a picture of of who this audience is. Now I think one thing we could do here, um, just while I'm talking, is if anybody wants to type it into the Q and A, if if we've got any requests. For any audiences uh, that you're looking at at the moment, who you'd like us to quickly do this is this is a live show. Why don't we uh, why, why don't we do it? If uh, um, I can I can open it up. Do you want to show up. how how you yeah. can drop down to yeah. so if anybody wants to have uh, as, as you say uh, uh, us to put on a um, an investigation into and find the phobia of a specific audience. But what you'll see here, this is we've called this the Fubalizer. And what it enables you to do, you can look at country, you can look at so yeah, so we've got so yeah, so so we've got demographics, um, all of the stuff that you'd you'd usually associate um, with that, um, so income stuff like that. We've got attitudinal data. The idea really is to um, um, to uh, be able to plug into pretty much any you know sort of big market or segmentation you've got, uh, so we can look at. You know, people who are say um, ambitious and driven. Um, we can. We've also then got um, under that uh, so affinity. So the, this is based on uh, Google and Facebook's model of just the, all of the stuff people are interested in. So the subject. So if you like the stuff that's in the wheel, is how do you like your content? And the affinities are what sort of content do you actually like? So we could look at, say, people who are into, um, um, you know, sort of gaming or green living, or we can actually go right down into very specific things like looking at, um, you know, adventure and strategy games or, um, you know, sort of movies and things like that. Um, so it's a movie genres. So we could have a look at, say, I don't know, ambitious horror fans. Um, <clears throat> Who knows? Uh, so, 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 yeah. So, so you're you're kind of thrusting CEO who likes to drive uh, her kind of uh, bullet grey Porsche home in the evening and uh, settle down to watch a slasher movie. Um, here she is. Uh, so, what? Um, and so, so what we can what what we can do? I don't know. Has, has anybody got any audiences? Does anybody want to type one up? Mark, Mark threw out male Canadian doctors. Uh, doctors, we do have doctors, but um, we might not have it in um, the, in this database actually. Uh, but we let's let's have a look. Uh, country equals, and also yeah, I'm kind of curious as to why. Uh, yeah, but, what's uh, that about? 
Uh, so oh, I think Mark is interested in healthcare in general. I think he was just right. throwing words out there. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Right. Uh, but let's have a look at professional. And then while you're kind of setting that up, Tori, Scott's wondering, can you compare two personas in the Fubalizer? Sure. You can. Yeah. So let's. So here's his Canadian doctors, in case they're interested in uh, in them. So super visually driven. Uh, here you go. And uh, yeah, sort of weirdly not interested in authoritative opinion. Um, which I, I don't know. I, I kind of think we that, found that before, though, with doctors, because yes. do doctors are the authority. Yeah. So they true. are invariably pretty convinced that they're the authority, and and we've seen that over and over. What we should also add is that we've got twenty three major markets, and we can segment around the US in very specific ways as well. Um, and um, sorry, I was just looking at those questions. Oh, yeah. Um, I think what is also important to say is we've got America, we've got Canadian doctors, and then when you start to see that they're over-indexing and say stylized abstract beauty, what we're also able to do is this: if you go over to beautiful on the Phoebe dashboard here, and you can start to think about okay, what it is in this area that uh these these people may be interested in because what we've what we wanted to do and what we've built and what we found that uh brands particularly are engaged by is here's the insight here's the, the data into what we should be thinking about creatively but then how do we get the cultural nuances how do we understand what these audiences are currently engaging with so uh brian and i built the Phoebe safari and the safari takes you all around the world looking at the genres and then the kind of content that is being very successful. What we've purposely done is not included, um, not included advertising. We wanted cultural insights. We wanted it to be around music and design and art. And so what we, we have a team of planners and we have a team of cultural junkies who upload on a daily basis from around the world, the kind of content that uh, is relevant to spe these specific audiences. So uh, hang on a minute, we've got a question here. Americans who love the outdoors, typical audience in these parts. Okay, Good yes. question. And, and the one about entrepreneurs we'll come back to, and the one about uh, political campaigns, because we can talk to you about that too. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so we are looking at, uh, so Americans love the outdoors. Yeah. So so and and so we can get regional as well about this. So like, why don't we look at um, as you say in in your part. So let's have a look at people in the west of the U.S. Uh, who are interested in the outdoors, um, which is talk among yourselves. Yeah. So um, just to uh, mention about uh, uh, the political, um, we have had conversations and we, we have been involved in some of the political campaigns in the UK, which were uh, about understanding um, how to engage specific audiences. Now, what we do is then go, here's the profile, Here's a group of people. Let's explore how you show up. Let's explore how you historically have shown up. Let's compare the content that you have done with your competitors. Let's compare the key messaging. And then let's start to think about the blue ocean opportunities and the strategy that you can apply. Now, we have done it in the past where we will then brief their comms agency, their marketing agency. Um, or at times we have been um, known to move very, very fast and commission the content and had it made ourselves. So, so um, here, here then is, uh, I, I got uh, sort of US uh, interest in outdoors and I also kind of uh, thought it'd be interesting just to kind of compare and contrast by gender. So um, yeah, so interesting, these are men, uh, so, quite humor driven into dark outrageous surreal parody humor um again news analysis um is quite big thrilling unsurprisingly pretty big not very visually driven apart from sensual it's a little bit porny i don't know uh and women um 
is really different, quite polarized. Uh, so again, sort of the things I wonder, it's interesting that the, the guys who are into the outdoors are not necessarily into the wonder of the outdoors, they're more into the thrills, whereas the women are more into the sort of wonder, you know, again, heartwarming, social good, um, very, mm. re really coming out very big there. Um, so yeah, so, so that was kind of interesting as well that, um, you know, if you're talking to outdoors men and women in entirely the same voice, then maybe you're actually kind of losing half your audience. Mm. Women are actually incredibly discerning about what they find funny. And uh, it's very interesting. We were working with a car company in the UK who did a, um, well, thinking about doing a humor driven campaign and the humor that they were thinking of was predominantly men thinking about women, what women found funny. And we went in and sort of said, actually, you need to adopt it. They adopted some of it, but actually, uh, they consist continued, didn't they? And it was an absolute, uh, -uh. uh however, um, where do we get to? So we should show you also, we, so we once we were able to create the Phoebe wheel and the profiles, we can then go to the Phoebe Safari, um, which will then tell you about the kind of content, but then we can bring it all together into uh, a, a brief. And now that brief, um, have you got one that's already done and we can come back uh, to this, just yeah. so you can see. We do, yes. Uh, yeah, so, so this is the, this is what and the, the, this will output this absolutely automatically. So mm. it, it's it's like three as we say three clicks to the pub. Mm. So you can put your your messaging sort of grid on the top of this, output it, drop it into your template, take all the credit, mm. and um, away you go. Uh, you're welcome. Mm -hmm. um, so so yeah. So so what this does then is gives you um, a. a uh, uh, the Fubi wheel that you've generated. Um, it also then gives you the um, the the, the, the Fubi scores from top to bottom. So this is this particular one is what was this? Uh, mobile phones. Mo oh yeah. So people who are sort of into mobile phones and um, and but also early adopters of technology and stuff like that. So uh, yeah. So the top thing is trivia, spontaneous parody, dark outrageous other things at the top and at the bottom really not into spiritual life coaching sensual minimalist kind of kind of stuff quite quite kind of yeah kind of hardcore people um and again their attitudes so again you have your attitudes from top to bottom so this is just kind of like instantly generated uh you know you can make pen portrait traits of these people quite quickly interestingly really keeping up with new fashions and you know activity organizers and stuff like that so you know again things to kind of think about but this is the sort of monster page where what you get then is all of their Google and Facebook affinities um, from most to least uh, relevant. So the ones at the top, mobiles, gadgets and electronics, computers, all of the stuff you'd expect. Um, but, you know, if you and sci-fi and fantasy, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, sort of having all my prejudices, um, you know, sort, sort of reinforced here. But, um, you know, then interesting soccer is kind of quite high action games, adventure and strategy games, travel, stuff like that. And then down the bottom, the stuff that they're really not interested in ice hockey. Um, yeah, I, I'm kind of getting that these people had a tough time uh, if, if they played ice hockey at school, um, baseball, Australian football. Um, things like that are, are they really not not so into what well, you also then get some demographic stuff and things like that. And then what we can do is um, or you can do. Um, is pick anything you you like from the uh, the uh, Fubi Safari um, of or sort of global content and put together things for your um, your creative team. So you get a brief that's once at once super precise. So you can kind of say this is these guys really like parody, but they really hate satire. And here's definitions of both of those things. So you can really kind of get down to this is the exact kind of humor. This is self deprecating humor. It's not outrageous humor. Um, so you you know which again, it really helps, I think, agency clients relationships we've found because it takes a lot of the subjectivity out of, I don't see the joke on this page. Well, it's deadpan, there isn't really a joke on the page. Um, and actually sort of helps people get a common um, language around um, what, is, what actually good looks like. And, and these, so these kind of examples then are really, as Tori said, it's anything but advertising. So the idea is that it can, 
get the creative teams um, or the content teams out of their bubbles and and especially with global work as well um you know mm -hmm. sort of what does outrageous humor look like in china um or um uh, south korea as um you know sort of sort of gives you a sense of you know will this stuff translate um we we look to editorialize when we start to when we first started thinking it's like a lot of brands are really wanting to understand how to bring editorial thinking entertainment thinking to a lot of their work it's fast turnover it's multiple uh, content on a very regular basis and so we were kind of very started to think about actually how do you provide uh, instant insight how do you start to have a, a data-led proposition that can supercharge the creative work you're doing so that when you're going back to your clients you're able to say to them this is what the data said, this is the examples, this is the cultural nuances, these are the trends, these are the cliches, these are the areas to avoid, these are what the competitors are doing, and this is how we can make the most of what this campaign or this works. So when we start, first started working with the Phoebe, we, were realized, we, we set out to build a consultancy. And then actually what we've found is that once we've taken brands through this, uh process and through the data and through the opportunity that they were coming back and saying can we have a login can we have access to your data and then when we kind of went oh actually yes you can and we will create the fubalizer and so the fubalizer is open to every one of you to jump on and use um uh, and it's updating all the time. We, uh, to be clear that the data uh, is data that we commissioned and that we own. Um, it has, uh, in particularly in the UK, there's very str strict restrictions about GDPR data information. Yeah, we're not Cambridge Analytica. No, and no. we own and commission it. This, the data set that you have here was uh, last year, we will be commissioning more and we work with certain clients who are very specific in the areas that they want. So we may be looking at NGOs, for instance, or we may be looking at scientists mm. and we will go off and we will get that data. It normally takes anywhere from two to three weeks um, and we will get a, a, a sensible sample size and then we'll put that into the fubalizer. So, um, Louis, you asked about how how about beginner entrepreneurs? Oh, sorry, sorry, I've actually just done Rebecca. Oh, um, have you? Hi, Rebecca. Um, so, uh, uh, so uh, yeah, so um, Americans who might be interested in electric vehicles. Um, so uh, here, here you are. Um, so this is people who are interested in green living and performance and luxury cars. Um, so, you know, again, obviously we can sort of zoom in on that but um so but um there's so yeah sort of quite humor driven apart from satire um you know into their hot lists hot lists are kind of like cultural curation what's cool where should i go um stuff like that unsurprisingly into quite extravagant imagery um sean you say have we used this specifically to target those in vaccine no we haven't um it's been a very complicated uh, space to get into uh, in terms of the data and the information. And we have tried. Uh, but yes, I mean, we, we could definitely do a, a sort of foodie on people, you know, who are yeah, yeah, sort of, I think, probably very socially conservative, mm. things like that. But there was, um, oh, there's a question about um, so, sort of what insights have surprised us. So there's a, an, an interesting one, um, which is, that we're working with a quit smoking uh, campaign. And um, one of the issues, um, or, or one of the things we found about smokers is that um, they, they, they massively over-index in dark humor. And um, also one of the top uh, affinities is horror movies. Um, so one of the things that we would, and then you know, one of the things that came out of that was this hypothesis, which is in, in, in the UK, <laughs> cigarette packs are just have plastered with pictures of cancerous lungs and sort of rotting mouths and and and, it, and and we were kind of saying we think that maybe quite a lot of smokers find this funny or entertaining and then when you actually go and do some qualitative work around that is sure enough people are going like yeah i've got the whole set um you know and it's kind of like when a new one comes out what's up it to my friends and kind of going okay well so maybe this kind of shock tactic 
isn't working with these guys because it's actually this is this is what they watch for entertainment mm. um so uh american women who drink a lot of wine uh. <laughs> while, while, while you're queuing that up in the fubalizer you know do, the question prior to that is 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 your data set especially better or worse in certain areas do you find that you yeah. have better insights in different places um so so i i, I think I think that, um, I mean, it's to what, what Tori was saying earlier was, you know, this is, it's designed uh, for, you know, general, general marketing, mass marketing use. What we can do is go out as we have done with say doctors and lawyers and things like that for specific clients who have said, we have a niche need in this, in this area. So um, what we can do is create a, a sort of, custom data set for that for that client which uses the same model um, but enables you to get super granular on 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 a you know sort of financial services professionals or something like that mm. so yeah that that's that's entirely possible to do mm. but as as it stands at the moment we have uh approximately 35,000 people in 23 markets major markets and so what we find is that when you're working with a big FMCG and they're looking at understanding the difference between launching a campaign in part, one part of the US versus another part of the US or uh, a US launch and an India launch, what, um, what, 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 are, what do the, those people have in common and then what do they not? So how can you start to think about the creative that lands across that uh, both markets and then if you're going to create uh, content that's relevant to one what is it going to be and how specific and focused is it going to be but sorry to, where's the wine to, to answer the question well yeah I mean it, it, um, is that Jessica it wouldn't be entirely ethical to ask people if they drink large amounts of alcohol um, but uh, we have we, we could certainly give you say foodies um, so you know people who appreciate um, the taste of things uh, so and so that the, the, you can see it but you know super visually driven um, interestingly like outrageous humor um, heartwarming again um, handy tips so actually we did a thing for a, uh, a, a wine client which um, was was about handy tips and he did one which was how to open a bottle of wine with a shoe and uh, that got it's millions of we can share it with you actually it made it yeah. on oprah and uh that wine went from being uh, a boutique wine to being the number one selling rosé wine across europe and the french are furious because that's not how you sell wine through comedy and he's he's had a few glasses when he does the demonstration and yeah that, that's what makes it absolutely perfect um yeah. Oh, yes, yeah, so we, we were going to do yeah, young entrepreneurs or, or beginning, yeah, beginning entrepreneurs. entrepreneurs. Excellent. Thank you. OK, uh, yes, I know we, you, you keep getting bumped. Uh, so, <laughs> oh, that's, that's me. Uh, profession. So what we um, are also saying to any of you guys, if you want uh, us to run uh, an audience for you, just get in contact and we can run the audience and we can put together a Fubi uh, brief for you, um, then you can see how relevant it is. And uh, we can also share some case studies with you guys and you can see how it works. Um, we work in two ways really, which is um, more in-depth consultancy work, but actually uh, this is a platform that we're saying to people, you know what, it's a, it's a license, it's a very affordable license for global data or localized data, and it's all yours to use as much as you like. Um, and we're finding that brands um, are, their content teams, their insight teams, their analytics teams are using it for a variety of purposes. One is at the point of conception to think about what work should we be doing? They're starting to think about how they brief their or, or brief each other, brief their content teams, how they brief their agencies. They're starting to think about how the media companies are going to use this. Um, we're now starting to work interestingly with TV companies who want us to FUBI 
the formats that they're creating and then see how applicable they are to the brand sponsors. We're starting to think about working with big publishers and platforms about how to FUBI the content and what uh, matching FUBI there should be being served around it, what content should be served. So if, if a certain kind of editorial is bringing an audience, how do you, how do you maximize that? Um, so it's, it's a very versatile uh, tool and it's a very versatile data set. And so it'd be really interesting to see what other people would use it for. Um, and, and friends, um, <clears throat> for those of you who are not Think Northwest members, I encourage you to become a member. And um, as part of your membership, you have access to this tool. Um, after this presentation, I will also email all of the registrants. Um, perhaps, Tori and Brian, would you like me to share your email address? How how do you want people to S share it with me? I can be the gatekeeper. Um, <laughs> And, and, and also to be clear, what well, we're really, really excited to say that we'll run something for you. You can see what it works, how it works, see how you, how you can use it. And then we can get into a discussion about how, uh, how we can potentially work together. Excellent. So we'll be sure to share all of that information to all of our mm -hmm. attendees. Um, this was really exciting. It was really cool to see all of this, all of the data and what the data means, because in this day and age, there's a lot of data, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it means anything. So mm. taking that information and parlaying it into your marketing campaign, into even the creation of content is very helpful. So I want to thank both of you for your time today. I want to thank everyone for joining us yes, today. And um, we hope to get to work with you in some other capacities very soon. Fantastic, thank you. And thank you for giving us your lunch hour. And um, next time, I hope that we are all see you face to face because if we all have to do another Zoom, as good as it is, uh, we might lose our shit. So uh, thank you very much for being very patient with us. Totally agree. And, to and Tori, this will be your chance to come to Portland. Yes. <laughs> yeah, thank you everyone days. someone give me something to do there I need to, to come to um i need to come to portland and i need to come and hang out and meet all you amazing people because the work that you're doing is fantastic and we would love to know more about how we could bring what we do to you do to do something even better because you're a very very talented group of people and uh it's been a privilege to chat to you all today so thank you thank you Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Stay healthy. Yes. Bye. Bye.